All right, I think some of the people in the back are pretty much hopeless uh, to get them drawn up here to where the real action is. So um, we'll get going and uh, hopefully uh, a few other people will come to the front, but it'll be their loss if uh, they're not smart enough to join uh, what I think is going to be uh, a great uh, food at MSU, our table event here tonight. Um, I just, by, when I start by starting, I just want to uh, echo some of the comments that Melanie made earlier is that we're very excited uh, from the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and Ag Bio Research standpoint to really begin to build a stronger and stronger relationship with the College of Law because we think the intersection of law and food has been an important area for a long time, but it's getting more and more important every day. And so we're really excited to have this um, event here today. So we've met in some different places, including a recycling center, but I'd say this is probably our fanciest venue to date. I think the next time we do it, we'll probably have to do it in a barn or in a dump or something, but uh, just kind of balance it out. But uh, it's great to be here. So let me uh, get things rolling by uh, introducing uh, the host of, um, of our table, Cheryl Kroschenbaum. Cheryl? Thank you so much. Um, sure. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. And um, folks in the back, if you would like to wander up throughout, we would love to have you participate as well. And thank you all for joining us here tonight, as well as the College of Law, of course, and Ag Bio Research, uh, and the College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences. Um, tonight's conversation is all about food law uh, and also culture. So food law shapes our expectations, our preferences, our attitudes about what we eat, changes our conversations about what we expect to encounter in a meal, when we travel abroad, when we eat with our families. Um, and in turn, that changes our culture. So that's kind of the gist of what this hour table is about tonight. And I always come with a set of questions and it gets a lot more interesting and exciting as we turn things to the audience. So I'm gonna start with brief introductions of our esteemed panelists here. I'll keep them short. If you're interested, there are, uh, there's more detail about them uh, in the bios that we have. Uh, and then we'll just open the question session and turn it over to you guys pretty quickly. So to my left, as many of you know, as many of you have been listening to him, I think, throughout this meeting, uh, we have Scott Haskell, who is the Director of Professional Services with Sustainable Global Agriculture Solutions in Seattle, but he's also adjunct faculty with MSU's College of Law. He was in large animal private veterinary practice for 17 years before entering academia. And his global agricultural experience includes working with programs and consultancies in 29 countries. And I also just learned he happens to be one of our aquaculture and sea urchin experts as well. Thank you. We also uh, have Don Opal. Don is an assistant professor of digital media and user experience at the College of Arts and Letters at MSU. Her research focuses on the improvement of design of communication in nonprofit, government, and clinical settings. And she also partners with Mid Michigan Health and Legal Clinics, social services, and community organizations. And finally, but not lastly, we have Anne Felina White. She's an associate professor of theater studies at the Department of Theater within MSU's College of Arts and Letters. So, Anne's scholarship on U.S. popular performance, protests, food culture, and politics has appeared in various theater and performing arts journals and publications. I'm so delighted to have this combination of expertise here today because I think we can speak to what shapes law and how institutions are put into place, but also how that trickles into medicine and culture more broadly. And so to get things started, I'm going to ask Scott my first question. Um, I want to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about how standards, guidelines for hygienic practices, recommendations are developed around the world to address the globalization of the food trade, including the increasing risk of emerging and re-emerging foodborne pathogens, along with the cross-border transmission of infectious disease. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is becoming a huge issue as, global, as globalization increases and improves um, around the world. Uh, animals are traded, um, products are traded, and uh, moved um, across borders with or without uh, legal constraints, and uh, diseases go with those animals. 
So we have a, a number of uh, programs in place that start out with the OIE, um, the uh, World Veterinary Association, and uh, it's the monitoring body throughout the world for animal health. So with that, we have per performance guidelines that have been put in place, as well as the usual ones we're used to, HACCP, HARPIC, um, ISO 2200, are all um, mechanisms whereby we can evaluate systems. Uh, good management practices come from HACCP and HARPIC. Uh, if you're not familiar, globally, we utilize ISO 2200. That is the esteemed um, 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 evaluation scheme uh, used in most nations around the world. Um, HACCP started in the United States as well as Denmark and then has morphed into um, a global program, but most international corporations like to see ISO 2200 on your evaluation program. It helps to, to, uh, to um, allow the processing plant, the production plant, to, uh, to have management practices that are deemed essential. And so most facilities will write up a plan, uh, a management plan that enables them to go locally to utilize the, uh, the uh, indigenous species, to utilize indigenous feeds and, and, and uh, feed groupings within that general climate. Uh, one of the problems we've had in the past is feeding outside of a regime, having breeds outside of a regime that don't do well. Taking a Holstein from Holland to Zimbabwe is probably not a good approach. Mm. So we try to blend that with these management programs. Thank you. Interesting. Well, shifting kind of from this broad global health institutional perspective uh, to closer to home, I, Don, can you talk a little bit about how the healthcare policies we have in place affect the way professionals talk and work in the food space uh, regarding nutrition as a part of clinical health? Sure, so I would say that the most important thing to remember is that clinical practice is driven by what can be reimbursed, right, by either the health, by either insurance companies or by the government for Medicaid. So because of that, um, a doctor or provider may recommend that someone, say, take a medicine with food, but the food obviously isn't going to be a part, it'll, it's a recommendation rather than a part of the prescription, right? So one of the things that, um, that I think is important to look at is how that creates a cultural uh, sort of paradigm whereby food is not necessarily a part of a more holistic approach to health. And so um, one of the things that, that we're looking at, and well, I think we'll talk more about later in the, our table, is how um, what a, a more holistic approach uh, to our healthcare policy that incorporates food as a part of wellness and a part of a prescription of health, what that might look like. Hmm. Well, we're thinking about how policies shape our conversations. So turning to Anne, um, there are so many big food topics we hear about from a policy standpoint, a standpoint that makes the news right now. I mean, things like regulations related to food deserts, um, the impact of large-scale industrial farming on the environment, food safety, even gender. Uh, can you share a little bit about what theater artists have been doing both in the past and now in response? Sure. Um, so, uh, theater artists and citizens uh, taking artful approaches to activism and protest um, uh, have, it's a very incredibly long tradition um, from, I don't know, bread riots on. So, one example that comes to my mind is um, pro women in the progressive era, and this links directly to uh, the medicinal properties of food or when food is framed in that way rather than in a, um, in a frame of family or domesticity or something like that. Um, but in the progressive era, for instance, um, women were really interested in the regulation of milk um, because children uh, were being poisoned by fraudulent dealers um, when women would purchase the milk. So um, women used that issue in order to create performances, street performances, performances um, in suffrage events uh, to, to advocate for suffrage and for new regulations um, on milk production. Uh, more recently, in, in um, 
In the 1970s, uh, Dario Fo, uh, in the Italian context, was dealing with um, uh, food prices and consumer activism. And in a play we, uh, called We Won't Pay, We Won't Pay, um, they looked at the corruption and the political pol uh, policies of the municipalities that were spiking food prices through the roof. Um, recently in Los Angeles, a uh, cornerstone feeder company started a six-year project in 2012 called The Hunger Cycle. And they've been working with um, a d different stakeholders from lunch ladies to um, uh, farmers to uh, those in um, government and those in healthcare systems producing uh, performances based upon their testimonies and their life experiences um, to discuss issues such as food deserts, um, diet, uh, parity and food equity and justice. So those are some examples. Great. And does everyone here know what a food desert is? Do you want to just Explain that right. Well, a food desert is really um, an area where there is no real access, practical access, as it were, to um, uh, fresh foods and vegetables. So you might have a convenience store, which will have a lot of processed food products, but nothing um, that is uh, considered healthful um, and nothing that is fresh or readily available, mm -hmm. right? And so there might be something nearby, but uh, transportation limitations, um, and it usually affects urban populations um, and those impoverished citizens. Right. And, and I'd like to point out also that um, food deserts occur elsewhere besides urban populations. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a little tiny town in Arizona in the mountains and there was one little tiny market, that was it. And 55,000 cows and 100 people in the town. And so you shopped at a, at a facility that mostly was processed food, junk food. No vegetables, soda pops, cookies, candies. And that was the place that most of the local people would shop at. So yes, I totally agree with the urban environment, but many of the rural environments that I've seen in Kentucky and Tennessee and, and elsewhere have the same problem out in a very rural uh, environment. So it's uh, multifactorial. Right, and if, if I could just add to that, with the increased industrialization of agriculture, subsistence farming went away uh, in rural environments as the land was bought up which contributed right. to that Absolutely, issue. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting new research coming out geared toward evaluating uh, areas and socioeconomic status and um, opportunity and things like food deserts and obesity and a lot of cardiovascular disease. Um, we did our first hour table actually on food access last fall, so we'd be happy to share more about that with you later as well. Um, it's a good segue into the next topic, which I want to turn to Don about, because it has to do with the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or what we commonly call SNAP, which has been in the news quite a bit lately due to the Farm Bill. Um, Don, can you give us some examples of what a, food, what a food is, I guess, and what it isn't, and how <laughs> shopping for what counts as food in certain areas is more difficult, as we've been discussing, when these healthy, fresh foods aren't available? Sure, so Congress legislated um, through the Food and Nutrition Act of 2008 what is considered a food and a food item. Um, and in general, it's important to remember that it's a food or food product that is for home consumption. Um, and that can also include seeds and plants that can be grown for food consumption in the home. So what that, what that eliminates are hot foods that may be sold in convenience stores or um, you know, corner markets, places like that, um, and that other types of, uh, of food items that might be considered food in certain cultures, such as live animals, birds, and then also vitamins and supplements are not considered food under the Food and Nutrition Act. Um, so, and then there are, uh, there's another subset of sort of hybrid items like energy drinks where the law states that if it has an FDA nutrition facts label, then it is considered a food. And so therefore it is eligible, uh, you can use SNAP benefits 
um, to purchase it. But some energy drinks do have an FDA um, nutrition facts label and some don't. And so often when you're in the store, you've got to go through, like if you're at a convenience store, you've got to go through and look to see what has a nutrition facts label and is therefore considered a food and what doesn't have one and isn't considered a food. So I see two kinds of issues with this. The first is, um, I think, ties back to what we've been talking about for a while, which is that, um, is that certain foods that you would easily recognize um, that are more conveniently able to purchase are not considered a food. Um, the second is that, that several things that would be um, culturally appropriate foods in various cultures are not considered foods under the Food and Nutrition Act. Mm. So we have people with expectations, maybe especially, especially people who aren't originally from this country, going out and looking for their familiar food items and then not being able to get them on the SNAP program. Absolutely. So particularly if, you, if you're used to shopping in open air markets or places where you would purchase um, you, certain kinds of animal seafoods, things like that, as a, part of your, as a part of your diet, that would not be, that's not, uh, you can't really shop there with SNAP. So, mm -hmm. um, so it, makes it, it makes it slightly more difficult both with, you know, both with convenience items and with live and, and pre-cooked items, which may not fall into those categories, which pushes people often into more processed foods that are easily identified as food um, okay. with FDA labels. But maybe things that have more added sugar and added salts. And yeah, I, and I think that I think that it standardizes. You know, it kind of forces people to certain places in the grocery store where they know what, or you know, in a convenience store where they know that that counts as you know as uh, eligible food items. Mm. Well, Scott, scaling back out a bit to regulatory policies, I'm hoping you can touch on the concepts of food safety and performance objectives that guide industry and government in complying with food safety and global public health goals and standards. Um, so how do existing programs help to ensure quality control, and how does this work around the world? Well, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the programs around the world are, are, are extremely varied. Um, generally, by continent, uh, they change radically. One of the things that, that I was thinking about uh, when you were discussing the SNAP program was the changes that I've seen in Nigeria over the last 30 years. And in Nigeria, um, the population, the rural population, has switched from a cassava diet, lots of vegetables, to eating a lot of rice. And the incidence of diabetes in uh, Nigeria has quadrupled because of a, of a primarily an all rice diet from an all bean and cassava diet. And so that, that's a, a huge issue, especially again in rural areas. Rural areas of Southeast Asia and South Asia where I work have a completely different problem. They have issues with trying to find enough protein. They have the rice. They have the vegetables, but they don't have adequate protein sources. Mm -hmm. um, South Asian uh, individuals generally don't eat beans. So it's either going to be fish, seafood, or, uh, or chicken. Other animals are usually too expensive. They go into uh, an entire gamut of special holidays and events. So most of these countries rely on a neighborhood slaughter facility or a neighborhood um, uh, producer of vegetables, cassavas, whatever they're feeding. And so it's, it's difficult to get a complete um, program of health if from these um, um, uh, marketplace slaughtering facilities. Usually they're slaughtered in place. Most of them hang the meat for a day or two in the sun. They have a lot of fly contamination and the milk the same so they'll end up with uh, a lot of diarrheas. Camphlobacter is a common one. Uh, Listeria tends to be fairly common, but probably Salmonella or Campylobacter are the real big ones that we see because of lack of consistency and transparency in, in the food safety that's at that venue. Um, specifically, uh, that tends to be more of an African uh, processing scenario than a Southeast Asia or South Asia because of the difference in product. Uh, you have a lot of Hindus, a lot of cultural differences where, uh, and Buddhists where the hanging of meat uh, is offensive so it doesn't occur as much as it does uh, in Africa or the Middle East. 
So um, it's nice to try to instill that. Um, the la I was in Myanmar uh, several years, of, uh, Burma several years ago, teaching HACCP. And um, it, was a, it was a great program. The people were highly energized because they had a motivation, marketing, all right? Australians had come to them and said, we really need poultry. We will not buy your poultry unless it is ISO 220, uh, 220, uh, uh, 2200 or HACCP certified. So they had me come over and certify five different slaughter facilities. Uh, it was a two week training, intense training. We did HACCP, uh, the first grouping of HACCP, hazard analysis and critical control points for those of you that don't do much food safety. And then we did a second grouping to teach, um, um, to teach uh, individuals to then go out and teach other uh, Myanmar, Myanmarians uh, to, uh, to produce HACCP. So they then, after that, after we certified them, they then started selling their products to Australia, New Zealand, and several um, Middle Eastern countries where they could get premium price rather than the prices they were getting locally. And they were flash freezing them. I'll tell you, by the time we were through, their, um, their marketing facilities and their processing facilities were incredible. They had storefronts with frozen chicken and um, they were marketing it to locals as well as global processing. And it was infusing hard cash into people that had no hard cash. So it provided the, uh, the producer with a good income and all of his employees were well cared for. They had instilled a health plan. They instilled um, uh, a meager retirement plan, but for Burma, for Myanmar, that was huge, just huge. So it was, uh, it was wonderful to see. I've worked a bit in Africa with HACCP uh, and Halal, and that worked out uh, very well as, as well, but the motivation wasn't there because of the marketing. Mm -hmm. That global marketing prospect was, was extremely valuable. Uh, I did a similar program in Haiti, because again, with Haiti, as you know, pre-earthquake, post-earthquake, completely different country. And so they're starting to market externally to France with uh, rabbits, uh, which was a, a, a very a productive um, export for them. And how is the success of those programs evaluated or benchmarked? Absolutely. So um, the, one of the projects I was on was a USAID Agency for International Development project. They require uh, that you monitor success. Mm -hmm. So we come in six weeks post-program monitor how the program's going. Then two months, four months, six months, eight months, and a year. And we come back in stages to evaluate exactly if the, if the, if the plan is being followed, mm -hmm. if, we're, uh, if we have the train the trainers uh, in place that are working locally to be a, a productive unit and monitor it over a year. I like to come back, and I do this many times on my own dollar, come back two years later and see if it's still in place. If you're in place two years later, you have a success. And I will say that many projects I've worked on over the years were limited success. Um, but when there's a market available, a global market where these individuals can, can make hard cash, it's a success. Hmm. So it was ple uh, pleasant to see. That's a great, well, I don't know if I'd call it an ending, but that's a great in-progress story. Yes. Um, well, Don, something I wanted to ask you about um, is that California, back to the U.S., has just passed legislation for a new program to prescribe healthy food as medicine for certain conditions. So I'm curious of your thoughts about that approach as well as whether you think that's something we should consider here in Michigan. Sure. So first I would like to say that I think the food is medicine program in California is very exciting um, because it's one of the first um, wide, it's, it's the first large scale policy that's been rolled out to, uh, to make food a part of a prescription for health, meaning that in certain kinds of chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes, um, there, it is possible for a provider now to prescribe a home delivery service of three healthy meals a day. And this kind of a program 
has been piloted in smaller areas. Phil in Philadelphia, they did a small study that indicated that, um, that prescribing um, three healthy meals a day um, over the course of a year or two um, with certain kinds of chronic conditions uh, reduced the um, improved health outcomes considerably and reduced healthcare costs dramatically. And so one of the things that we're looking at in these pairing programs where we pair food um, with healthcare is to see if the healthy food that comes in, particularly in targeted, um, with targeted patients with certain kinds of chronic conditions, if it can um, reduce healthcare spending. And so instead of going to the emergency room um, with, with, uh, to receive care for type 1 diabetes, having three meals a day, hopefully to sustain a healthy lifestyle, will take people out of the hospital and the emergency room and return visits to, the, to healthcare and reduce healthcare spending. California is trying to see if it can reduce its Medicaid spending and is, is really targeting uh, its, uh, this policy by looking at whether or not if you give someone three meals a day, prescribe them three meals a day, if they will actually um, over time um, be, uh, you will be spending the money on the food rather than on health care costs and on the cost of Medicaid. So it's a really interesting proposition in terms of the, the discussion around Medicaid and Medicare spending. I think that um, I've been working in Michigan with small projects, uh, small pilot projects that partner uh, healthcare clinics with, uh, with food banks and other um, food pantries. We're looking at ways to get um, fresh food into um, particular kinds of clinics across Michigan. Um, so I think that these kinds of projects that try to address more holistically the social determinants of health are going to be really important. Um, they were certainly um, incentivized under the Affordable Care Act and I think are really crucial to moving to a more value-based rather than cost-based healthcare system. So I'm very enthusiastic to see how it goes in California and to get to get more data to see mm -hmm. if um, to see what the numbers look like. Um, if we can be uh, using government um, spending on food rather than on emergency room bills, I think that everyone would be really happy with that outcome. I think that's really interesting because we often think of quote unquote bad foods, but foods with a lot of saturated fats, salt, sugars, as the reasons that people get certain debilitating health conditions. But we're often not perceiving it as something that's, that's another way to stay healthy. Like I feel like the reverse is, is the story that's told more often in our culture than the kind of story that we're hearing about now. And I'm curious your thoughts about I mean, the culture, I, I, was in, I lived in California before I moved to Michigan, and, and we're obviously talking two very different cultures. Um, what, do you think, what do you think maybe can be adopted here? Do you have any ideas to make this more of a, a, a normalized um, perceived benefit of food in a place like this? Well, I think that it starts, I mean, at least in the work that I'm doing, changing the culture in clinical practice mm -hmm. to embrace the idea that we all work together toward a healthy individual. And that really changes a sort of, um, like, using, like, right now we operate with kind of, um, like the idea that a, a patient or all of us that we operate at some kind of a detriment that like we're just not working out enough we're not eating healthy enough if only we tried harder and that does not take into account like the material realities of a lot of patients and so I think that this uh, strategy it's a huge cultural shift in the sense that a healthcare provider is taking the onus and that the healthcare system takes the onus onto itself to say that we can be providing providing more, our work as healthcare providers can be more robust to include, you know, why do we put all of the burden on people who are differently situated and we can't, like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I think that social work has this very well, like, they very well understand and appreciate sort of the difficulties that are imbued in being told to eat healthy or to, you know, to exercise regularly, that, that you can tell someone that, that we are fighting cultural and material conditions that are way beyond the ability for, like, an individual to, you know, to take that on. I think 
think that what I've been enthusiastic about is seeing the ways in which healthcare is working with nonprofit organizations. And this is very much a part of what I do every day is to improve the communication channels mm -hmm. across healthcare and the nonprofit sector so that we can try to work together um, to, uh, to make these realities. I'm not so certain. I think that we're really going to be relying on organizations like Blue Cross Blue Shield to incentivize this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And so really it's going to come from the private payers. It has to. And I, I don't think that government policy is particularly in Michigan in this political climate is really going to drive that. But I do think that there's possibilities when people see the ways that I do think that healthcare spending can be reduced in the long mm -hmm. run by some of these partnerships. That's interesting. Um, I, I have a ton more questions I'd like to ask, but a big part of our table is making this a community conversation. So I'm going to ask Anne one more thing, and then we'll open this up for discussion with everyone here. And if I get a chance, I might slip one or two more in. But we've been discussing you know, how to change cultural perceptions internationally, nationally. Um, but Anne, you've been doing a lot of research looking back into history. Um, thinking about what people's perceptions were earlier in the United States. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what you learned when you were researching your first book, Cloud Under, which looked at people's reactions to Depression era policies. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about what you learned in the 19, about the 1930s. Sure. Um, so uh, one thing that I learned in looking at the history is um, that a lot of people don't look at the interconnections between farmers and um, consumers and uh, the government, right? So it tends to be, you can only do so much as a historian and uh, often uh, times people were looking at these different populations in isolation and really focused on one set of interests rather than looking at the integrated whole and how very much they impact one another. So um, what I learned in looking at um, immigrant female consumers in Detroit and um, homeless, non-property owning uh, sharecroppers in, in Missouri and property owning dairy farmers in the federal government, um, all centered around the single food policy, was um, that the investment in um, food, what one um, <laughs> what one group would do would deeply affect another. So, for example, um, when the federal government was paying farmers um, to decrease production because there was not enough consumer purchasing power for the farmers to actually bring to market the foods they were producing, they couldn't actually even harvest food. Uh, dairy farmers couldn't bring milk to market. It, couldn't happen. They didn't have enough, uh, they weren't getting enough for their products to actually produce. And consumers did not have enough purchasing power to get what they needed. Mm -hmm. So when the federal government was uh, working to increase this central commodity, um, when people were hungry there was a huge outcry because on the one hand there was a deep belief that food is a fundamental human right. Um, and on the other hand there was a uh, a deep, long-standing uh, American belief in that, uh, in the meritocracy, right? In that you really um, earn your living in the most literal, fundamental sense. Um, and so, for instance, when meat uh, prices soared uh, in Detroit following uh, decreased production uh, and housewives rebelled, they rebelled because cultural belief, you were talking about, um, I believe it was the South Asian context where they needed more protein. Well, in the US context in the 1930s, we had plenty of substitutes and we knew about substitutes because of the First World War. But uh, there was such a deep-seated belief in the Polish-American population that there was no substitute for meat. And masculine health and, um, and energy could not be supported so without meat. So that um, these women were protesting because their husbands were unemployed. And they had a deep fear about the fact that if they couldn't get meat for their husbands, their husbands could not find work. They would not have the energy to do what needed to be done in order to find work or to work the full day. 
Um, so you see that happening at the same time you see um, dairy farmers who also um, couldn't um, bring milk to market and an outcry against them because how dare you deprive those of us who need milk, women and children, um, because uh, milk was considered the nation's fundamental food in breeding good citizens, healthy citizens, um, that farmers uh, blame was placed upon them for not just giving it away. Um, and so you see the way in which um, we all become deeply tangled and by paying attention to one another you can recognize the mutual dependency um, and, and also really recognize the, um, the truth of the matter in terms of the belief of, uh, of food as a fundamental right. Yeah, And you can test that and that's, that's what I learned. Yeah, all these pieces come into play. I believe, wasn't it in the Depression era and beyond, lobster was considered the cheapest poor man's meal, whereas now we're willing to pay almost anything for a pound. Yeah. Well, once uh, we could figure out how to package and, and distribute it, mm -hmm. then it became a, and that really occurred in the, in the 30s, mid 30s mm -hmm. to late 30s with refrigerated trucks and right. refrigerated hauling, yeah. But our tastes are very malleable. Mm -hmm. And so I think we see through depression era politics, through a lot of the policies that we set in place, that we're willing to accept a lot of things as normal and matter of factly that maybe just look that way to us. So it opens up a whole other set of questions, but I'd love to, to turn things to you. So who's our, do we have a mic runner right now? Oh, Holly Whetstone is standing with the mic. So if you have a question, raise your hand and she'll come over. And also, please tell us uh, just who you are as well. Hi, uh, Ed. This is where, yeah, Ed Brezhen. I'm here for, uh, with World Bank. I'm, I'm interested in this idea of food as medicine, um, and uh, you know the dialogue perhaps with the insurance companies because essentially, the insurance companies are getting a, um, a double benefit. <laughs> um, your self-medication is essentially you're um, internalizing your copay, and uh, the fact that you're uh, medicating. Uh, you know, better nutrition uh, is actually going to uh, favorably impact their actuarial tables in terms of the probability of your illness. And uh, I'd be intrigued as to whether you know, they have any appetite for rebates and what kind of conversations you're having with them or what, what that might entail. You know, and how perhaps even, I mean, since you know, it's a good conversation, how social media might help form them some opinions around that. So. Yeah, I think that, yeah. first I loved all the puns. Um, I, think, I think it's interesting to watch the dance that's kind of going on right now in healthcare policy because, you know, because we all realize that the, the chronic conditions that are bankrupting the healthcare system are largely due to lifestyle and to um, environmental factors and the social determinants of health. So it's like we all know but now we're sort of figuring out who is going to pay for this. Like who are, and, and you know, knowing full well that, that lifestyle, that stress, workaholism, nutrition, you know, that these are all the things that are affecting heart disease, diabetes, like all these things that are breaking the system. So I watch every day at work, um, people try to, like tiptoe, like the healthcare system, the insurance company, and the government in this dance, and, and the food banks too, because I'm working with the food banks to figure out who will supply the food, who's going to pay for it ultimately. You know, because I think, I, and, and in a cost based system right now, the providers and the healthcare systems are like, we cannot and turn a profit. Like, it, it cannot, we know that we know what the problem is and we know why people are sick, but we can't pay for it. And we're going to try to pass the buck and get someone else to pay for it, and we're just passing it around and around and around and around right now. And so it makes it very hard to design an intervention and, and actually do it, which is what uh, the work that I'm doing and the work that I'm doing with my colleagues who are here. I'm like, you know, so we're all like, come on, we know what to do, let's do it. And so I think the Affordable Care Act was a compromise in a sense that we all sort of, we recognize that 
certain healthcare systems are taking advantage of ince incentives that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, at least still some, that exist to try these things, um, particularly with our most vulnerable populations in this country um, who also tend to spend, get most of their care in the emergency room. So because of that, there are most expensive, like the biggest drain on the healthcare system. So everyone's sort of in agreement that that targeted, you know, that perhaps there's a place where the healthcare system can work with the government to you know to figure out who's going to pay for what now the private payers still think we should pay for, if we can pay for health insurance that we should pay for our food so california is the first one to say you know let's you know but still they're targeting medicaid um, the, so in terms of, that's why I'm like, I think the big hope is, I've seen a, a plan that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is, is attempting with particular kinds of social determinants. It hasn't moved as far as food as medicine yet, but I do believe that we all see the writings on the wall and that's kind of the direction that we have to incentivize, um, we have to incentivize nutrition and less stress if you, know, you don't want to be paying out on um, health and on heart disease. And I just want to say, I really liked, I believe it was the last bit of your question where you touched on the role of social media. Because I don't know the answer, but I could see that going a lot of ways. Because if there's anything that social media does, it's uh, spread a lot of information and a heck of a, probably a lot more misinformation. But I think potentially could do a lot of good on an issue like food as medicine. So we'll leave it to Don to figure that out for us at some point. <laughs> um, does anyone else maybe have a question? Looks like maybe here. Um, hi, thanks. I'd like to thank all of the panelists. Um, this is very fascinating uh, conversation. Um, and I was interested, could you talk more about the role of theater? You talk about um, performance, and I was uh, in the, oh gosh, hold on, sorry. Um, in the food policy protest, because I'm particularly interested in how the medium of theater can add to our conversation also today, how it adds to, um, we have social media, we have websites, we have, uh, I think ultimately the question is, what can theater be giving us today um, as a way to spread the word? Sure, um, and I think I'm gonna answer it in two ways. So um, the, f the first thing I would say is, you know, we're a media saturated culture, but we're also a, uh, theatrically saturated culture. And so what you will see happen a lot in terms of activism and resistance is fundamentally theatrical tools being taken out of the theatrical context, right? Being taken out of the theater and brought into the streets or brought into, um, uh, uh, you know, public realms of debate, for instance. So um, you will, f during um, SNAP debates um, in 2007, 2008, when they were talking about canceling uh, or er cutting it significantly once again, um, a lot of uh, legislators performed the, um, the basically the food stamp challenge, right? Where they tried to eat on this limited budget of like $3.28 per day or something, whatever the absurd um, amount of it is. And so they, they, they performed um, in this sort of trial period and all failed right to do it. So that's a highly theatrical tactic, right? Is to take on the, um, the positionality of someone who is in need of the SNAP program. You'll also see in, in the protest realm the use of food um, in these, because food is such a compact symbol, right? Like if I were to pull out an apple or something, first of all, you'd be impressed because you're like, where is she hiding it? I can see <laughs> under the table. But, but after that, it has, you know, from biblical associations to medicinal associations to, and, and that the compact use of it in the, um, in the, uh, the activist realm, um, it's such a strong symbol that when you deploy it, when you destroy it, when I spill milk in the streets as a farmer did in the 30s, right, all of that sort of spectacularness um, 
uh, resonates in an incredibly intensive way because of the combination of both spectacle and the quotidian element of food, right, in, in all its materiality. And then the other thing I would say is in the theater itself, right, theater is a um, unique um, community forum in which different worlds are imagined, yeah, and in which we get to exercise our empathetic imagination. So um, a lot of uh, dramatists and uh, theater artists are um, raising awareness of all sorts of issues. So there's this crazy play um, about the indignities for farmers of large scale, of like just increasing scale, um, and it's a play called Pig Farm, right? And so as, as theater moves through its various circuits, whether they're regional theaters, national theaters, global theaters, right? Um, you can, a, a, a really, um, it, it gets distributed, right? In the most, in a really intensely local way. So it's just us and you could reach out and touch me if you needed to, but then you hear it and you talk about it and then you go, oh, it's on tour or oh, it's happening here or it pops up on the street because that happens too, right? Theater artists are sort of uncontrollable, uncontainable in that way. Um, it, it moves awareness through all of these circuitous routes. Um, so, does that answer your question, Sonia? <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Deandra Beck, Michigan State University. I'm curious, the, the Association of um, Public and Land Grant Universities had a big initiative last year to look at horizon issues around food uh, for the next decade, and I called it the challenge of change. And one of the big efforts um, that's been proposed as an area needing more research and, and attention is on food waste. And the uh, dimensions of food waste, of course, can be uh, loss from insects or post-harvest problems or et cetera. But there, there's also a big component, component of this in affluent societies where waste is kind of coupled with um, food safety issues, you know, disposing of products uh, on due dates and, you know, when I was a kid you could go buy day-old bread and nobody said anything. Now that day-old bread gets dumped, for example. And so there's, and yet there's communities and food deserts as you all were talking about. Can, can one of you describe kind of what's happening in the legal realm to look at the liability issues and the mitigation issues around uh, food waste from a legal standpoint and a food safety standpoint? You're our attorney. You know we maybe we should crowdsource. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know yeah, that. I, I, oh. Yeah, let's. There, there's got to be an expert in. Yeah, there's a. Uh, you might know about, it, but there's a one program that addresses this. Perhaps not so much on the waste, but on the loss. And then there is a difference. If I think, I think whatever. But on food <laughs> loss that might be post-harvest, uh, not used. There's a program uh, in Baltimore right now called uh, Hungry Harvest. Have you heard of it? You have? Okay, good. Uh, and what they do is essentially source what would otherwise be thrown away. I mean, I have a subscription for about $15 a week, and it's like Christmas every Sunday. And, uh, you know, nice tomatoes, some misshapen potatoes from time to time, but it's all quite good. Uh, and uh, it doesn't get wasted. I actually think in a lot of places, there's some, you know, some un latent entrepreneurship there uh, because it could be mopped up and utilized because essentially the cost of it's zero. It's going to be thrown out anyway. Mm -hmm. So it could be uh, used for public procurement. It could go into school feeding programs. Uh, I mean, there's value that could come from it. So, yeah. To, to add to that, um, <clears throat> it's, it's becoming a real problem for the animal feed industry. Many of our uh, pet foods are, are made by agricultural waste and waste products. And those are becoming um, increasingly utilized in the energy realm as well as uh, multiple uh, programs that take that away. So it's driving the price of pet food up and also many of those spent agricultural products are fed to livestock. And uh, again, 
those prices are being driven up. So it, it has sort of this, this cycle that's working through. It's, it's being utilized or not utilized in the human realm and it's being declined in the animal realm because there's less available um, agricultural waste. So globally, um, similar problem. When you have everyone in, um, in a culture or most of the people in the culture are extremely thin, do you think those animals are going to be extremely thin? Absolutely, because the animals get the food that's left over from the human population. So um, one of the challenges for new, uh, uh, new American uh, um, 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 agricultural workers in foreign countries is that they don't understand. Why aren't your animals fed better? Why don't they have improved body condition scores? When in fact, the people that have the animals are so thin that there's no conceivable way that those products, that waste product is going to be shared. Uh, the best you could probably do is with small uh, uh, poultry operations. But for the most part, in many cultures, there is no animal waste. There is no human waste. There is no waste product. In the United States, a different story. But still, it is impacting uh, my talk tomorrow. Uh, one of the uh, components I'll address in animal feed is that, that that market of extensive human waste product is no longer available or is lessening in its availability. So it's problematic on a different realm. Hmm. Now, I just want to add, I'm so pleased that food waste came up. I mean, I can't speak to the, the legal aspects of it, but um, food waste is a priority of food at MSU. Our second hour table was on food waste. Um, we waste at least 40% of what we grow in this country, and we can do a lot better in terms of distribution um, and also saving other resources like energy and water and having more of an impact on a lot of our environmental concerns, um, a lot of our... Uh, our social concerns as well by tackling food waste. So this is something we do really want to spend a lot of time on and I hope does keep coming up in these conversations. Um, I do want to add that, um, sorry, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Jack Felberg, I'm a master's student in packaging and uh, I like to add that for like food waste you just have to kind of get like creative with it with new ideas. Um, right now I'm currently developing uh, a uh, plastic material made out of orange peels uh, with LDPE. And um, the, there's just a bunch of opportunities out for like agricultural waste, there's tons of it. Uh, I have a booth over there if you want to come talk about it. <laughs> Get some advertisement out. But, uh, so thank you. Colleen Burtka from the J.M. Smucker Company. I did want to comment on food waste. Actually, in Northeast Ohio, in our community, we have many of the food banks in the area have a night shift where they will go to the grocery stores and pick up close to or out of date products to take to the food banks to allow within that window of expiration that they follow. And also, there are a handful of grocery stores in the area that are actually discounted grocery stores that also kind of have the same night shift that they'll go pick up from the grocery stores, but also set, sell that food for a discounted rate for the community. So anyone in the area who is low income or is struggling for food or anything, they are significantly discounted. So those families actually do utilize those, those facilities a, a, a vast amount. Do you mind standing up? Oh, sure. Well, I just got a lot of stuff. No, that's OK. Sorry. Um, Gina Haas, the J.M. Smucker Company as well. We're, all, we're both dietitians, so this is like perfect for us. Um, I actually worked in Detroit for a year, um, and the food bank there was doing amazing work with taking, again, expired food by like a day, um, repurposing it, to even teaching the inner city community how to use different produce that they might not even know how to cook. So they, there's a lot to do with food banks and putting some responsibility on stores to kind of say, you know what, instead of throwing this away, what can we do the day of to give it to someone who could use it? And I, you know, obviously expired food, that's very expired, that's an issue, but there is not much legal for the day of, like you can sell that. You can give it to someone for free for them to use it. So. It is nice that that's available. It's just a lot of responsibility on us to say, like, okay, instead of throwing this away, 
what can I do to get this to someone who needs it? I'll have to stand up. I'm sorry. This is weird. Um, <laughs> I wanted to bring this up. I'm sorry. Donnie Sake from uh, Wayne State University. Um, I wanted to say this in relation to food waste. Um, it's kind of weird because it's not really interesting or like, sexy to talk about. Um, but I think one of the things that we might think about with respect to laws and food waste is actually um, local ordinances and laws around dumpstering. Um, so there have been a lot of activist organizations that have been around for quite some time, particularly um, uh, food Not Bombs is one that I can think of since the early 90s, um, but specifically have focused about around like waste that's coming from uh, grocery stores and thinking about ways in which that food can be repurposed, particularly to feed um, urban homeless populations. So I don't really have a lot to add to that, but that's just one sort of nugget that I wanted to add to our discussion around food waste. So. Well, thank you. Does anyone else have a question, or should I move on with my long list? Or... Trace McCune with Lamb Weston. So, food manufacturers want to make food that people will buy. Then you've got the consumers, and then you have the government that regulates how foods are sold. So, can you talk about um, the accountability between these different groups? for offering nutritious foods, uh, when a lot of times consumers get blamed for making bad choices, food companies get blamed for making foods that aren't nutritious, and the government gets blamed for not having regulations to um, make nutritious food available. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to men that I wanted to mention too is the way that certain kinds of additives and preservatives that have been approved by the FDA have changed the way we shop, and and it also affects because it affects shelf life of food, you know, and and more and more Americans go to the grocery store say once a week, once every two weeks, you know, and they buy a lot of food that has a very long shelf life. It has also affected the way that we consume and the types of foods that we consume. And I think in a way that has it has some sort of symbiotic relationship with the food waste discussion that we just had that I think is complicated and it involves like sort of who's buying what and how that. But I know that those kind that those kinds of policies, the fact that we aren't we don't really know why bread lasts two weeks now when it used to only <laughs> last a day but we know that you that that bread does not for some reason does not mold for a week you know and it will stay in your pantry um, those that is all the effect of FDA approvals for certain kinds of preservatives that are now in our food so um, so in some ways it has changed I think the cultural understanding of you know, the idea that you would go to the market and get fresh food to, to cook for dinner is no longer like an American um, cultural standard. So, um, so and, that, and that feeds into, I think, the, the dramatic uptick of chronic conditions that we all suffer from that, um, that are related to the, the eating of a lot more processed foods and foods that have longer shelf lives. So I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that I've directly answered your question, but I think that, um, I think that there is something to this idea that we, that we tend to treat, like we, we tend to, I think, and it's an American cultural like ideal too, to sort of blame the individual and to operate um, as though the, the individual works at a deficit um, rather than like taking into account systemic and institutional like, like choices that the FDA has made in terms of what foods end up on our shelves in the grocery store. So, and that affects all people, not just folks that to have, take SNAP benefits, um, but, you know, but, but everyone that's shopping. So. Yeah, which uh, which just um, and I I think of it from the depression era context. But when Don and I were first talking about the California law and experimenting with it in Michigan, my first response um, was to go. I, I felt a big brother, and I felt a deep paternalism and a blaming of the individual for the disease, right? And that potential when diet gets involved and when culture is potentially not taken into account um, or not considered valid when it comes to health, right? So that somehow 
cultural um, associations with food, a person can easily push aside because it has to do with their health, right? So you can forget culture and you can remember your health. And so for me, my concern is the, um, the intimate knowledge of, um, of one's diet, right, by an insurance company for someone that then becomes an insurance liability. Um, and that, of course, is all uh, based on the sort of blaming the unemployed for being hungry, right? Uh, even in the context of the Depression, it happened. Um, and so I think I, I'm, I'm really interested in that dynamic, right? It's a, I think that addressing the social determinants of health puts us in a tension between understanding that certain conditions in our lived experience affect our health and then attempting to get at those from an institutional perspective inevitably will set off someone like Anne. But for someone like me who looks at it and says, um, you know, that this is a life or death situation, particularly for someone who might live in a food desert, to have, to, to at least know that, you know, home delivery of food eliminates the transportation issue it eliminates so like environmental factors are all eliminated so for me it says you know is that a trade-off that is worth taking and I think that's the question that's sort of the you know that's the philosophical ethical cultural question that is that is what we what we would ask particularly coming from the humanities I think um, but it's us, us what I find really amazing about this conversation that Anne and I are having is that is that when you go to the medical community, you know, that would, none of this would even be, like even the idea that you would engage in a more holistic approach to health is so left of center that it would never even be engaged with at all. So Absolutely. like, so like we're sort of looking at, I don't know, I find this fascinating. Yeah, but, um, I feel like it's a really, <laughs> it's a really exciting problem to have. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing the excitement. I'm saying this is really exciting. What about all of these cultural implications? Like, when can we get to those, right? And, and let's get to them before we get to the end of this. Um, I'm or so before it's totally insti institutionalized and then I'm writing about the protesters, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, and that brings up an interesting piece too. Uh, if you remember a handful of years ago, coming straight from the White House, we had people wanting to push simply that, I think it was like the children eat more vegetables, mm -hmm. and there was pushback just for something as simple as that. And we're living in this culture where it seems like every other commercial on television is like a hot dog wrapped in a burger that's wrapped in a <laughs> cheesecake, and that's the newest thing that everyone wants to go out and buy, because that's, we, we celebrate, you know, we celebrate holidays with food, but, but that, is inherently part of our experience in this country. So if institutions try to go in and change that, it's not something that they can just come from this top-down perspective and say, okay, now you're all gonna stop eating that, you know, turkey inside a duck inside, whatever it is that people do on Thanksgiving now. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm the last person to have the solution to this. I just, I think you do bring up kind of a lot of interesting pieces of this puzzle. Yeah, yeah, and the, uh, the fundamental human right to food historically is the hardest thing to get anyone to pay for because it's a positive human right. So it's, right, so the, uh, what I mean by that is a negative human right is you may not do this thing. And it's really easy to see things you may not do, right, and to guard against those and, and uh, create policy and laws regarding those. But when it comes to everyone deserves access to health care, food is a human right, yeah. Who's going to provide this, right? And who? And it's such a fascinating issue that you're dealing with because you bring the question of whether or not access to healthcare is a human right and access to food is a human right together. And so I find it fascinating. And then what kind are you providing? That's so, right. So we've experienced that a little bit with putting the food pantry in a medical clinic because what you provide then, what we saw initially was that certain folks would only take certain kinds of things that were offered. So, um, so that affected food waste coming from, you know, when we brought 
fresh food and vegetables to the clinic. And, um, and then sort of also the cultural sensitivities around what food a food pantry takes, how they sell them as commodities for in exchange for fresh food. And then do, so what we ended up, I think in, in a certain clinic they added a nutritionist who would teach about the use of certain produce items at the same time. So you go to the doctor, you get the food from the food pantry, and you get a lesson about how to cook it, and you leave. And that's pretty, in, like that's an integrated approach, but also I think, yeah, you're making, you inevitably have to make cultural decisions about what that person should do with their life, you know, when you're making, and it's, so yeah, it's a very interesting, um, but the idea being that, you know, that if you can get it all there, the hope is that, you know, there can be a, a dialogue about what is possible in terms of your health more holistically. Took the wind out of those sails. <laughs> yeah. We got excited. <laughs> well, we are winding down on time, um, but I I'm going to at least squeeze in the question that I really want to ask, which is to Anne, because I only asked you two things at the beginning. But you are currently working on, this, this is a, a non sequitur, because this is just a very different project, but I'm, I'm fascinated. Um, you're working on a project relating to historical showbiz cookbooks. That's true. And how celebrity and food culture are harnessed for and mired in both national politics and gender and race politics. So I just thought it'd be fun to hear a little bit about that. Um, since this is sort of ties into this broad sure. conversation. So um, I, we all know like Gwyneth Paltrow has a cookbook and Freddie Prinze Jr. has a cookbook, right? Um, they're everywhere. Celebrity cookbooks are everywhere. And, um, and they've been everywhere um, since the Civil War, at least in this context, uh, in the US context, excuse me. Um, and so what I have been looking at is the ways in which um, celebrity cookbooks influence uh, food culture, and food culture sort of in, um, in terms of the labor. Right, kitchen labor, which is both gendered and racialized labor for much of, of the century. And so uh, I'm looking at the ways in which different um, uh, actresses, for instance, discuss food as an art form, whereas, uh, and sort of praise domesticity, um, the exclusions and of any um, African American um, performers from these cookbooks until mid-century um, and at the same time the constant invocation of the theatrical figure um, from minstrelsy, the mammy figure, um, as a way to create um, the feeling of home and how celebrities use that theatrical figure um, at the same time excluding um, any reference to African American influences on cooking, even though most likely um, the cooks in the households of famous people were either African Americans or Irish uh, domestic workers. So that's, in a nutshell, the kind of thing I'm looking at now. And now uh, you mentioned uh, one of my favorite examples of celebrities who talk about food, Gwyneth Paltrow. And obviously in that, <laughs> ah, so in that case, like, she's someone who gets a lot of things wrong. Yes. Um, so are you exploring things like yeah, that as so well? So there's a number of fascinating, um, speaking of food as medicine, there's uh, a wonderful cookbook in which celebrities were tapped, this is probably like 1927, um, about an all vegetable diet, right? So the, the, the science behind an all vegetable diet and different, it was actually athletes, celebrity athletes who were tapped. Uh, to uh, offer testimonials about the health benefits of this all vegetable diet. It's a very strange all vegetable diet. I'm not suggesting that vegetarianism is not a good thing. That's not at all what I'm saying. Um, but it was this sort of very particular fad and trend. Um, and really how um, the admiration and the aspirational qualities that a fan might have, right? If you consume like a celebrity, you'll end up like a celebrity in one way or another, right? Beautiful, wealthy, happy, whatever might be imagined. Um, and they get a lot of things wrong and yet wield a lot of power. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, does anyone else have anything to say? If not, I'll give everyone on the panel, Scott, Don, and Anne, a, a chance for any closing remarks, and then uh, just say thank you, I guess. Covered okay. a lot of stuff. <laughs> thank you all for coming. It's, it's been a, a wonderful experience for me. Um, I, I do enjoy sharing what I've done with my career. Um, and I think the importance of uh, global food and uh, feeding uh, the, uh, the 9 billion people in 2050 will be up to us as a generation and uh, to your students as they come along. Uh, feeding that 9 billion people when we can't feed 8 billion people will be a challenge. So gearing up for that, learning about packaging, learning about nutrition, learning about growing food, learning about GM food, learning about all these concepts, I think is extremely important. It's up to you. The, the mantle will be passed, and it will be passed shortly. In this country and every other country on this planet, we will have to come up with schemes and ideas and work together through transparency to make this all work. If we don't, it's going to be an utter failure. And I don't think it's going to be. I think in the end, we'll all pull it together. Um, and I, I, I hope that students at MSU, students elsewhere, can really see the big picture, not the small picture, but the big picture of global hunger. I think my personal feeling is, I think every American should go live in a developing nation for a year. It changes your entire opinion. Any act of entitlement you may have in your life is gone the first time you go to the restroom and there's no paper. So it's important for all of us to realize it's a global community now. Mm -hmm. And we're never going to get rid of that. Thank you. That's right. Yes, thank you. I feel the same way. Thank you so much for <laughs> to be able to speak to you all is wonderful. I would say that, you know, I started my career as a legal aid attorney and um, and now I work as a researcher on the design of communication in clinics, both legal and medical, and I find that my job is exactly the same, that we're all trying to work on, I think, incredibly complicated problems and communicating across disciplines and across industry, government, and nonprofit is what I found to be the most effective way to really cut a a against some of the, you know, the confusion and the questions that we have around what we might be able to do to make folks healthier and to get access to healthier food. So I really encourage like greater dialogue and I'm, I would love to talk to everyone that's here after this is over. So but thank you for listening to our prepared comments and, um, and, and thanks for being here. I feel the same way and I, I feel like, you know, I'm at, the, I'm at the end of this and they really have both, Scott and Don have summed up beautifully um, the power of an interdisciplinary panel like this. Um, I both uh, learned so much and so much of what you said resonated with the ways in which I think and understand the problems um, and the joys associated with food. And so it was really nice um, to hear about the ways in which you look for solutions to very similar problems. So thank you. And thank you all for listening. Well, thank you all so much for being a part of our panel. I mean, that is, that is the whole purpose, to have these interdisciplinary conversations about issues that are impacting us personally and globally and to include our community as well. So thank you all for coming. Um, we have a lot more coming up with our table. You can go to our website, which is food.msu.edu, to both keep up with our table, but also to be a part of the conversation there. You can ask questions, and we'll find experts to answer them. Um, we have a whole bunch of people across campus that are involved. So we hope that you all stay involved with, um, with our table and food at MSU. And of course, we hope all of you stay involved in what we're doing as well. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you. And thank you again to the College of Law, to AgBio Research, and to everyone with food at MSU. Thanks.